Hey, podcast world, welcome to this week's episode of FNO InsureTech. I'm here with my esteemed co host, Mr. Lee Boyd. Hi, Rob Beller. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm wonderful. Yeah, well, it's Good Friday today. It is Good Friday. So, this is a Good Friday episode. Well, it is a Good Friday anytime we have a podcast. <laughs> there you go. And you want to know why today is particularly interesting? I do. And that's because. Today we have a TED Talk. Can you believe that? You can't be at a good day with a TED Talk. Well, you know, it's not really a TED Talk, but we do have a very special guest on from QBE Ventures, Mr. Ted Stuckey. Who, oh, I get that. Who runs QBE Ventures for the global carrier QBE. That is very exciting. Uh, I've actually had the opportunity to hear Ted at uh, last year's on-ramp conference he spoke and is a, a very smart person and he's able to really talk a lot about uh, the changing industry insure tech what's coming what's going uh, so i think today will be a great day yeah and for those of you uh, who aren't familiar a corporate venture capitalist is a venture capitalist that is functioning as a venture capitalist on behalf of their uh, company or corporation to try to find um, startups that would help them, would help the company do what they do better, uh, faster, or w whatever the case may be. And so uh, rather than us trying to explain it to you, I think we'll let Ted do that. So why don't we why don't we do that? What do you think about that? I think that's a wonderful idea. Glad, Although that was a wonderful definition. I'm glad you approve. I'm glad you approve. And so without further ado, we're going right into our episode and our interview with Mr. Ted Stuckey from QBE Ventures. Hey there, like we said in the intro, we're here with Mr. Ted Stuckey from QBE. How you doing, Ted? Doing well, thanks. How are you guys? Good. Doing we're great. great. We're great. Are you having a, it's, it's good Friday. Are you having a nice day? Oh, absolutely. It's, uh, it's finally starting to feel like spring around here. Oh yeah. So tell us where you are. I'm in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, outside of Madison, Wisconsin, where QB has a, uh, a, a large operational hub. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I have one thing to say about, um, Sun Prairie and that's, uh, often burr. Very cold. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, it seems like the only time that we ever get invited up to Sun Prairie is when um, the temperature's in the single digits. And then snow is on the ground. And snow is on the ground. Is there a reason for that? Yeah. I mean, st statistically, that's about eight or nine months out of the year. So <laughs> that makes sense. So we shouldn't take it personally, in other words. No, no, uh -huh. not at all. Uh -huh. But now it's nice. Absolutely. It's getting, it's, getting, uh, it's getting to the time of the year that you love around here. Well, we're really excited to have you with us today because we try on our podcast to look at all the different parts and pieces of the whole InsureTech fabric that are woven together. And a big, big part of that, as we understand it, is venture capital and people who are involved in venture capital and, and even corporate venture capital. So wh why don't we start by giving you a minute or two to kind of tell us what QB Ventures is and, and what you do and, and that kind of thing. So jump in. Yeah. So QB Ventures is the corporate venture capital arm for QB Insurance Group. Uh, QB Insurance Group is one of the largest property and casualty insurance carriers in the world based out of Sydney, Australia. We have operations in over 30 countries and um, one of the, if not the most diverse set of uh, products from personal lines all the way up to um, large specialty risks uh, that you're going to find anywhere in the world. Um, so QB Ventures, uh, from a, a fund perspective, is committed to um, identifying and partnering with uh, startups that can provide QB with access to emerging technologies and capabilities that will help uh, advance our own operations. Um, so it's slightly different than um, other corporate venture capital arms in that some corporate venture capital arms are strictly um, financial vehicles. Um, some uh, 
uh, do a little bit more on the speculative side, investing sort of in longer term uh, strategic growth areas. Um, and then if you compare and contrast corporate venture capital with um, what I call sort of financial venture capital, um, your, your traditional venture capital firms, you know, they're investing strictly for, for financial returns. So we're, we're on a far end of the spectrum wherein we're investing very, very closely to our core operations and our, our core strategy to uh, really bring the benefits of working with startups. That's, you know, their speed, uh, agility, responsiveness, uh, talent, technology, uh, and trying to embed that into QB as quickly as possible. Um, and we do that in, in large part via the work that that the fund does in identifying those startups and investing in them. Mm-hmm. I bet that's super interesting. I mean, I, I, I'm just sitting here thinking what it must be like for these startups that are nimble and fast and, you know, can change directions in a day to work with a worldwide global enterprise insurance company that's risk averse and slow to change that must be an interesting contrast for them yeah it's 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 fascinating um in in a a a a really interesting challenge and really interesting opportunity for um qb ventures because we we in many cases sort of play that middleman so um you know we we we're really good at understanding uh understanding QB, understanding the place, how it works, what it needs, how to get things done, but then sort of on the flip side also uh, pretty good at, at, at working really closely with these startups to um, understand what they need and, and, and how they need to position themselves to, to continue to grow and, and, and do the things that they want to do. Oftentimes, there's a, a healthy amount of conflict uh, yeah, and tension sure. between a startup and a corporate and uh, it's our job in, in large parts to, to sort of bridge that gap. Um, and part of it is helping the startup better understand how to work with a corporate, which, which many, if not all startups really struggle with because we can't match their speed. We can't match their nimbleness. Um, and then on the flip side, it's from from QB's perspective and, and my peers' perspective within the organization, how do you work with a startup? Um, and and um, you know certainly as an organization, we're not used to working with um, these these small shops that um, seemingly can do everything for us. Um, and, and yet, in the same breath, uh, you know they're incredibly frustrated in how how slowly we move and, and the types of things that we require from them. So it's a balancing act. And in my opinion, the, the companies that, uh, the carriers that do the best in, in this new wave of insure tech are going to be the carriers that are the partner of choice for these sure. startups. Um, and if it was easy, all of us would be doing it, but it's incredibly hard and very few, if any carriers have, have really, um, shown themselves to distance, uh, from their peers in, in this. So I think the, the door is wide open for companies like QB to, to be really, really powerful players in this space. Sure. And I want to talk more about that, that, uh, those differences and, um, the art of this as, as we move through the interview today. But my, my first question to you is a simple one. And that is how can I get a really cool job like this? Is there like a program that I can take in college to, to get a certification, to get a cool job like yours? Um, (laughs) it's as cool as the title is, uh, you know, honestly, the, the, the thing with, with what I do and what I've been able to do, um, in, in, in my career is sort of equal parts luck and right place at the right time. And sort of this desire to understand far more about the organizations that I work for than my role or remit would typically require of me. Um, You can't go out and scout literally hundreds of startups a year like we do um, without being able to clearly articulate who QB is, um, who it wants to be, what it's good at, what it's not Mm -hmm. good at, where its growth opportunities are, where it's been burned, burned in the past. And, and, um, 
you know, the, the one thing that I constantly go back to is if you're just not, if you're not obsessed with the place like that, if you're not obsessed with your products and your customers and your markets and your competitors, this is a really tough role to be in. Um, because every day you're put in a position to either make an introduction or pass on an opportunity. Um, right. and it's up to you to know whether or not it's going to pass that initial sort of litmus test because you also don't want to be the person that wastes everyone's time at QB. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's tough, but it, it's a, it's an awesome opportunity and it's a, it really is a privilege to, to be able to do this on behalf of the organization because it's certainly a blast. Sure. I'm sure it's hard. I mean, it, it's like you're a little bit like a kid in a candy store. Absolutely. Right. I, at this point in time, in, in, the, in the progression and evolution of the insure tech world, it's early. And um, so the, the, the aisles are stocked full of fun toys to look at and take advantage of and knowing which one to say, let's go to the next step and which one to just turn your back on immediately must be tough. Yeah. And it's, it's also a, there's an element of just overall maturity as well. You know, we, there are, there's plenty of startups that we've looked at and we've had to pass on because the place just isn't ready for them. Um, and that's some of the more frustrating things that you have to go through in a role like this. Uh, because in, instinctively, the only reason you're doing this is to make the place better, is to, to, to bring the capabilities that we need to be competitive, that we need to grow, that we need to, to, to improve our customer's experience, that we need to be operationally uh, superior in. Uh, but you see these, these, these startups and, and you know that this startup or you have this, this deeply held belief that this startup is going to to be a game changer for QB, but if the place isn't ready for it, um, there's nothing you can do. And so a part of this is also saying, well, if I know or have a strongly held belief that we want to go from point A to point B over time, um, you've got to be careful to not just bring a bunch of startups that represent point B into the room because you're going to scare people away. You've got to right. bring some startups that are a little bit closer to point A that are going to start pulling you towards point B. Um, and so for me, it's mm. balancing, it's balancing sort of both sides of the equation. I want to make sure that I know any and all startups that represent our view of who the future of QB is and what we look like. Um, while at the same time I, I need to know, and I need to be close with the startups that can provide us immediate value today and that can match our maturity level in some of these areas. And, and more often than not, it's the stuff that, um, that, that we get really excited about this. A lot of stuff around product innovation, new risks, emerging risks, emerging distribution methods and stuff like that. Those are the things that it takes time for good reason for carriers to get comfortable with and to, to sort of grow in their maturity on. Right. So while we need to stay close to them, we also can't try to shove it into the place because there's value that we can glean today that we don't want to overlook. You know, you're, you're, you're telling us about the point A to point B and knowing what the company wants. And it really makes me wonder about your background. I'm, I'm, you know, where where did you come from, uh, more on a financial side or more of an insurance side, uh, to actually already maybe have some of this information on what the company wants? Where where give us a little insight into into your background. Yeah, so I'm one of the rare ones that um, knew really early on that I wanted to be in insurance. I knew in uh, when I was in high school that I wanted to be in PNC insurance, and so I I got my undergraduate degree in in economics with an emphasis in labor economics and. Uh, went into a, a, a monoline work comp startup uh, right away, which gave me just a, an amazing opportunity to see all facets of an insurance carrier, primarily an insurance carrier that was growing incredibly rapidly given its, its age, um, and one that was driven exclusively by technology. Uh, and that was our key competitive advantage. Uh, I then went from, from that small, scrappy startup to... Uh, to Travelers, who's arguably one of the uh, world's great underwriting companies, um, and spent quite a while there um, really figuring out what a carrier, what a good carrier looks like at scale, um, what it does differently than its peers, how it approaches market opportunities, and how it, how it thinks about transformation. And then 
Uh, I've spent the last several years here at QB um, thinking more and more about what emerging technologies mean to carriers and, and how a global specialty carrier is going to uh, position itself to take advantage of these opportunities and to hopefully sidestep some of the the, the challenges that are coming down the road for us. You know, you're out there shopping, you're looking, new technologies, new new ideas. How important is this? Is it, does it, and then I'm, and I'm not just asking in your opinion, but in the opinion of like your organization, is there a whole imperative built around it? I mean, is, is this a big deal? I'd say that there's an appreciation for the fact that uh, technology is enabling carriers to do more today than they have in the past and that it's opening up um, our eyes to, to new sources of data, uh, new information feeds that we've never had before um, and putting the onus on us to figure out how to use those to provide better protection for our insureds. Um, and, and ultimately that, you know, manifests itself through proc design and development, pricing, underwriting, um, claim handling. And, and so from, from our perspective, um, we, we definitely see the imperative to, um, be a more digitally driven carrier. Um, I like to remind people though, that that doesn't change the fact that we are an underwriter um, first and foremost, and that our promise is our ability to pay claims. And um, we, we can't skew too far from that. Uh, and so we need to look at technology sort of as an enabler of us to do, uh, to do what at QBE we called our brilliant basics better, that's underwriting pricing and claims. Um, and then also be open-minded to the fact that technology may create new opportunities that we never had before in the form of uh, new, new risks, uh, new products, new customers. Um, and we need to be open to that. Uh, but we can't deviate from what it is that we do as an insurance carrier. And that's underwrite price and pay claims. So, so whenever you're looking at a new company and whenever you're trying to think about uh, how you will implement them, you always have those, those three core concepts within your mind. Is that right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's really fun uh, to talk particularly with, with some of these insure techs who are, um, who are bringing new products to market, new insurance products to market. Uh, because one of the things that I learn a lot in those conversations is, the differing ways that people think about product development, the differing ways that people think about underwriting, per, particularly when when they they truly have have no legacy, they have nothing holding them back. Um, but I also keep in the back of my mind, um, you know, the fact that QBE um, holds a lot of value on having prior underwriting experience. Um, on, on having a book of business that's, that's performed in the past. And so while we enjoy those conversations, while I seek those conversations out, because it teaches us a lot about what the market's doing, we, we definitely keep in the back of our mind where, uh, where we need the priorities to be and where we need people to focus on. Um, for a lot of the stuff that we do, it's not a mobile app's not going to solve the problem. Um, it's something bigger. As somebody who shops a lot, right? I mean, that you're a professional shopper, right? <laughs> um, That's right. What are the best of these insure techs, regardless of um, which what what their product is that they're selling? Is there something that you find in common uh, that make up the uh, the best ones that they they have a an ethic or an idea or a process that they've gone through that makes them stand out? I, I would say there's there's two things. Anyone who's who's legitimately using new or proprietary data to um, work through the underwriting process, pricing in, in claims process, uh, I have a lot of respect for uh, because it, it definitely shows that they are thinking differently about how to do what is core to an mm -hmm. insurance company. 
Uh, and so I, I look long and hard at what is the information or what is the data that you're bringing in to your shop to make the decisions that you're making? And is it any different than the data that a traditional mm-hmm. carrier is using? So I think that's one. Um, and I think the second part is what's their customer acquisition mm-hmm. strategy? Uh, we, we often go to these conferences, uh, sometimes multiple conferences a week, and, and hear people belaboring the, the debate between are we going to be disintermediated or not when it comes to the distribution of, of insurance products to customers. Um, and I find that to be somewhat of an intellectually lazy debate because we forget the fact that um, besides certain personal lines, we really have yet to see anyone crack the, the customer acquisition code on commercial insurance. Um, and what our independent agents and brokers allow for carriers is a acquisition model. Um, it's acquisition, not distribution. And so if I'm talking with a carrier startup um, that is going to market with an interesting product, an interesting mobile app, whatever they think is their, their secret sauce, I always ask them, how, what's your distribution strategy? How do you think you can compete um, in, the, in the customer acquisition cost side of things? Um, and what are you doing that no one else is doing? Um, and if they don't have a strong answer there, then I know that it's going to be a pretty, pretty tough, tough road for them uh, because you're competing against people that can justify, um, justify a four-figure customer acquisition cost in personal mm-hmm. lines. Um, and no startup's going to be able to do that. So conferences play an important role in your, in your work, yes? Uh, yeah, yeah, I would say they, you know, the, the, the conference circuit right now is a, a little bit bloated, but it's an awesome, uh, awesome way to keep the, the networking and keep the network alive. We spend a lot of time, um, both with, you know, my peers and other carriers and as well as accelerators and other startups, uh, together at these events. And it's where we, um, oftentimes find the best opportunity to talk shop and figure out what um, what people are seeing and what they're hearing and, and where the market's going. So they, they are a, a, a necessary evil, I think, in my life right now. <laughs> in that you have to spend a lot of time at them? A lot of time, yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Were you just at OnRamp? Um, I, I was uh, snowed out of OnRamp, unfortunately. Oh, no. Um, I, I did, uh, I had an opportunity to, to speak on a panel with one of our portfolio companies, and so I Skyped in to it, which was one of the craziest experiences I've, I've had in a long time at a conference, but that's pretty uh, nice technology. Uh, it, yeah, it, it worked. I won't tell you how we hacked it to make it work, but, um, <laughs> it worked and that's all that matters. Well, what are some other conferences you enjoy? Or if, you know, you're saying that the conference store gets a little bloated right now. So what if there are some people out there who want to go, uh, to one, two or three conferences a year? Are there certain ones you would recommend? Yeah, I, I love the on-ramp conference uh, it's it's hosted by the guys at, at generator it's a midwest uh accelerator um they just moved the conference this year to, to minneapolis from where it had been in chicago for several years um it's it's an awesome networking event they do a really good job and what i appreciate most about it is um it's just the right amount of time it's just one day um you know there's different groups put on dinners and happy hours the night before and the night after but um it's it's a good quick event that that gets together the right people to have the right conversations um i don't think you can talk about insure tech conferences without bringing up insure tech connect um it's certainly the preeminent event of the year um everyone is there it's it's absolutely overwhelming uh but an amazing opportunity to meet with anyone and anyone anyone and everyone who's who's in the space um i will frequently have upwards of of 14 15 16 hours worth of meetings a day at itc um and and that's that's the reason you go uh, you don't go because it's in vegas uh you don't go for any other reason than you're there to meet with people um and get a lot of work out of the way um and and so it's it's certainly an event that we keep on the calendar as far out as they'll tell us the date, um, and 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 we uh, we do everything we can to get there. 
Um, the other s- sort of event that I go to and a, a handful of other folks in, in sort of the insured tech space go to, but more importantly, a lot of other corporates go to is uh, a, a conference called the Future of FinTech that CB Insights puts on. Um, and they're just this year, they're doing a future of insurance sort of day long event on the front edge of future of fintech. But what future of fintech does is, is really bring together some of the most preeminent thought leaders in, in fintech and insure tech, um, for very intimate sort of fireside type, uh, conversations. That's one of the few conferences that I go to where I actually sit in the audience and listen to a lot of the speakers, um, they'll bring in uh, you know, former high-ranking government officials. They'll bring in C-level executives from companies like Alibaba. Um, the big banks are all there. So it's, it's really, really interesting. And certainly in my opinion, the wave of insure tech is um, somewhat analogous to the wave of fintech. Um, and so understanding mm-hmm. and keeping a close eye on what's going on with fintech is helping me build out more and more of my theses around what's going to happen with InsureTech. Right. We've had people tell us that they think that it's just a few years behind the FinTech wave. Yeah, I think that's um, that's a, a completely fair comparison. So it, it's it's nice to have something to watch. That's huh? right. Yeah, we, we agree with you on that InsureTech. And uh, even with the on-ramp, you know, it is, those are some great events. I've been to both those and um, we love them. Um, you know, Whenever you do go to these conferences, uh, you 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 talk to a lot of companies, you interview a lot of companies, and I'm curious. A lot of our listeners are startup companies; they're insurance companies. Do uh, you have any advice or words of wisdom for these startup companies who are trying to get uh, in with a carrier or speak to someone like yourself? Yeah, I would say the the biggest thing is know what problem you're trying to solve and who you're solving it for. Um, I, I, I get a lot of well-intentioned entrepreneurs who seemingly will solve whatever problem I tell them I'm having for an opportunity to work with a company like QB. Um, and the, the value of working with a startup is not that we have an entity that we can pay who has engineers who can build us stuff. Um, it's that we have a partner who is a solving a problem that they feel very passionate about that we share in. Um, and so if, if you aren't able to articulate what problem you're solving and for whom you're solving it, um, but instead rather want to learn more about my problems and, and what you can do to solve my problems, the conversation is going to get off on the wrong foot. Um, so I think that's the, the big thing. Um, the other thing is, is just the basic know who you're talking to. Um, and, and under, understand a little bit about who, uh, who QBE is. Um, it's certainly mm. not a, mm. an ego driven statement. It's, it's really more of a, a, effective time management statement. You know, I still get a number mm. of people that reach out to me wanting to talk to me about life insurance and annuity products. Um, and we have <laughs> right. nothing to do with that. So, right. um, you know, you've, they, you've got to be careful. They haven't done their homework. Exactly. They haven't done, uh-huh. it's, it, it's, it's just sort of the, the, the basic stuff there. Um, and, uh, and then I think last but not least, and this is maybe a little bit further down the road, but it is important. Uh, you've got to have it, uh, uh, what I'm going to call an integration strategy. You've got to have a plan in your mind of how you go from pilot, which is a purgatory that a lot of startups find themselves in right now to, full-blown implementation. Um, You can't rely on the carrier to be able to tell you how to do that. Um, You've got to come to the table um, with that, that process sort of thought out. And that's a complex one. The more baked you are, the better it is for you, right? 110%. Yeah. Because uh, it's not fully baked. It's just more work that you have to do in the kitchen, if you will. Exactly. Exactly. Uh And that's not to say, um, you know, spend a bunch of time building out a super robust product before you sell it. Like I'm, I'm not trying to, um, uh, push back against, you know, iterating and testing and learning with clients. You have some imagination. Exactly. But you need to, you, you, you need to take a step back and say, when this goes well, when this small pilot with 10 users goes well, 
Um, how on earth am I going to take it to a thousand users? Like, mm. what does that mean for Scale. me as a startup? Mm-hmm. Um, because ideally, uh, the, the carrier will say, Hey, this is great. We want to roll it out countrywide, do it. And you can use your magical startup powers and move really, really quickly and say, great, we can have this done in six weeks. We know exactly what we need to do. Instead of taking a step back and going, shoot, you know, my infrastructure is not built to go countrywide. Well, if your infrastructure wasn't built to go countrywide, why are we having a pilot? <laughs> right. Um, yeah. You know, like, why what's the, why are we here? Yeah. What's the, what's the trade off there? So that's, um, it's just, it's, it's sort of a change in mindset on how you approach conversations with, with, with carriers. You, you need to know what you offer, the problem you're solving, um, why you're talking to that carrier in general. And then mm-hmm. you've got to have a relatively um, well thought out uh, idea for how this is going to get big um, mm-hmm. and what you're going to do to, to make that make that happen. You know, the uh, idea of problem solving is is terrific. And I think that that's a great piece of advice. We first heard that, you'll appreciate this, from uh, one of your coworkers, Alyssa Hunt, when we were talking, we, we have an episode coming up with her and, um, and, and she's smart and thoughtful. And I mean, she's a buyer too, right? Yep. And, and an implementer of different products, uh, pr- mostly on the claim side, at least in the past. And she brought up the idea of problem solving. What problem are you solving for us? Yep. Right. Not just, are you a shiny penny? That's right. But, uh, what, what's exciting about how can you how, how can you change our business? That's and, right, uh, or make it better. And, and, uh, and don't get um, don't get spooked if the first few people you talk to about the problem you're trying to solve don't recognize that it's a problem. Right. We recently had someone come to us, and it took a couple meetings before people were like, "My God, I didn't realize that was a problem." Mm-hmm. Like that makes a lot of sense now. Mm-hmm. Um, and if that that entrepreneur didn't have this like closely held belief that what he was doing was right for companies like us, um, he probably would have been on to a, a new startup by now. He would have pivoted. Exactly. <laughs> right. You know, gr- grit, I have to think that grit is critical because uh, I know just from working in sales um, that uh, you, you have to have grit, man. Or, That's right. Or, uh, you know, you're going to get a lot of no's before you get a yes. Particularly when you're selling to carriers. You've, you've got to have grit. You've got to, you've got to really believe in, in, in your product. I'll look at, um, uh, Chris Cheatham, who's the, the CEO and co-founder of Risk Genius, one of our portfolio companies. And, and, uh, he's been selling into carriers now for years and, um, just hustling, just doing everything that he can to make sure that no stone is left unturned. Um, and, selling the story, selling the problem that he's trying to solve. And you look at the implementation of, of risk genius within QB and you say, why isn't everyone using this? Um, it's that amazing thing. And, uh, even though I love our industry, like we can, we can be a little blinded in our, in our vision. Um, and, Sometimes there's five or six or seven or 15 or 20 people that you could or should talk to at a carrier. And it just so happens that you talk to all the wrong ones. Um, and that'll happen. Yes, and right. if it was easy, we'd all have startups and we'd all be doing great. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but grit and hustle is, is such a big part of it. And if you're not interested in doing that, um, which not all entrepreneurs are, not all investors are, are interested in backing companies that have to do that. I completely respect it. Um, I would encourage you to, to not waste your time in, in insurance because you're really not going to, to you're not going to change it on your own, um, certainly, and, and you're going to probably get pretty frustrated pretty quickly. Well, just us who provide services to the industry, uh, it could take years. It can take years. Yes. And so patience <laughs> and having the resources to be patient is going to be important if you're going to work on your, if you're going to yep. try to sell to your end of the business. Um, 
and and you know, Risky Genius is that's a, right. really an, an interesting company. And you and I'm gonna just when we're offline, you got to hook me up with them because we really want to do an interview with them at some point in time. But for um, sure, uh, can you share just real quickly like a success story that you've seen happen? I mean, you must have tons of great stories um, of of an insure tech that's come along and fought their way through and made it. Yeah, I'll. I'll um... I'll use an example since you mentioned Alyssa earlier of, of one that, that Alyssa worked on, uh, uh, I, an awesome, uh, uh, Boston area based startup called high Marley. Um, and, and high Marley has this, uh, AI based, uh, chat, uh, capability for carriers to communicate with claimants. Um, and, and what Marley did when they came into QB, uh, was really all the right things. They had a very well-defined problem statement and a very narrow application of a technology that arguably could be used for anything. So when you think about like texting, like we could text brokers, we could text, um, insureds during the, the underwriting process, we could text, uh, risk, risk engineering clients. We could do all this stuff, but they said, no, let's text claimants. Let's make that claimants experience beautiful. Um, they had a very, very well articulated, um, pilot process, uh, that they, they put on the table to say, here's what we generally ask for from our carrier partners. We need this many resources. We need this amount of time. Here are the KPIs that we track. Do you agree that those are the right KPIs to be looking at? Uh, because I've seen it over and over and over again, these pilots that start with no KPIs and you think, well, then what on earth are you trying to prove? Um, and they, they stepped in and said, these are the KPIs that we want to measure. Here's how we're going to do it. Here's what the kickoff event looks like. Here's what the duration of the pilot looks like. When we get to the end of it, if we do X, Y, and Z, are you in a position to implement this? And um, it really took our team aback. It, it, it made them really appreciate the effort that Marley had had put in mm -hmm. um, before this mm -hmm. um, to go through that process. And I will tell you, it was the fastest turnaround from initial contact to implementation um, that I've ever been a part of. Um, and it, that's exclusively because of the work they did. The, and and um, I know a little bit about them and that they came, they're insurance guys. They're, te they're tech guys. But they're, well, I guess you could say, that's right. I'm going to be clever now. They're insure tech guys. That's right. And, and they, and so they, they came from that background. They know, they knew who they were talking to. Yep. Right. And they knew exactly what, um, people in our industry wanted to hear and what probably what your impediments were and your problems were going to be. And, and they knew that before they ever talked to you. That's right. They, um, really, they, they, uh, they, they really did the whole process uh, brilliantly. They've since um, raised uh, another round of funding. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they've expanded their deployment with, within QBE. We just recently um, uh, announced publicly some of the success that we've seen. Uh, it, it's mm -hmm. been a, a really awesome experience and a really, really, I think, important case study on how you should engage with carriers. It wasn't yeah. perfect. Were we slow? Yes. Were they fully, you know, ready to support every single piece of the process that we were looking for? No, but that's what you get when you work with startups. Yeah. It was, well, it was just a beautiful experience though, all in. That's a great story, Ted. And I'm glad that you shared that with us. And in, in the few minutes that we have left, I want to talk about your peers. When I first talked to you, you told me that, there's like a group of CVCs, carrier CVCs that you guys see each other and you work together. I mean, that's not real common in our, in the carrier world. Traditionally, we kind of don't play nicely with each other, but that sounds like it's very different in your world. Is that, is that the case? Yeah, I think it is. I, I mean, the, the thing that's often overlooked about innovation within carriers uh, which ultimately is the sort of the driving force behind doing anything in the startup world is being innovative, um, is that innovation is such a, a, a culturally dependent beast. Um, there is not a uniform definition of what innovation means to an insurance carrier, 
Um, and everyone approaches it a little bit differently. Um, and that's not to say anyone's doing it right or wrong. Um, it's just they're doing uh, exactly what they can or should do based on their culture. And so how that comes back into the point of so many of us in this space sort of collaborating and working together, it's that we know the startup we're meeting with is probably solving a problem that one of our peers has, if not our own problem. And so it's important for us to support the market, to support the ecosystem, first and foremost, by making connections and sending startups to other carriers that we think could be uh, beneficial or, or, or get value out of that interaction. Um, secondarily, there, there is a bit of, uh, of, of validation in, in knowing that a startup's working with, with other carriers. Um, and by and large, um, we embrace that and we think that's outstanding. Uh, anytime any of my portfolio companies can raise funding, um, from another carrier or, or sign, obviously sign commercial deals with other carriers. I'm ecstatic um, because it is such a tight knit, knit community. Um, but we we do we spend a fair amount of time uh, just debating where the market's going, debating where the ecosystem is uh, is is evolving, um, debating what's going to happen next. Um, we don't always agree. We don't have to agree. Um, but, but I think there's a mutual respect and appreciation that these jobs are really hard. Um, it's, it's hard to, to get a, a large insurance carrier to, to work effectively with a small startup. Um, but if, if other peers are doing it, that means that, that we need to be doing it even better. And so there's a mutual respect across this peer group. Um, that we're all, we're all working our tail off. We're all trying to make our carriers better. Um, and, and by virtue of that, we're trying to make the industry better. And so um, it's, it's a really, really neat part of this sort of insure tech wave that, um, that I love to be a part of. Well, last question for you is, uh, uh, so what's hot? When you guys sit around and uh, maybe have a cold beverage and you talk about, boy, this, this segment of the market is on fire or this is coming or this is what I believe in. What are, what are some of the, some of the uh, areas of interest that, that you guys all share? Well, it's clear that carriers uh, use of artificial intelligence uh, continues to expand um, and it, it continues to be, um, you know, very use case specific um, and so at a carrier like, like QBE, wherein we have um, uh, just a wide variety of different AI startups that we're working across everything from uh, distribution and marketing to claims and underwriting, pricing, proc development, um, cap modeling. Um, so we're, we're seeing more and more uh, AI startups getting traction, which I think is, is outstanding. Um, Inevitably, we, you know, I, I think there's mutual agreement that uh, IoT is going to become a, a bigger deal um, in the not too distant future. Um, there's still uh, some some challenging adoption rates in various lines and stuff like that, but uh, we we all see a shared vision for that, um, and 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 that's really interesting. And, and I think the one that we, you know, we, we watch closely and certainly one, one that I watch closely goes back to what I talked about to start. And that's the fact that several of these full stack carrier startups are, are getting traction. They're, they're writing business. They're seeing results. Many of them are being very transparent about it, which is, I think, superb for the market. Um, and so watching them and seeing what they're doing and how they're doing things differently is motivating. It's inspiring. It should be a bit terrifying to some folks. Sure. Um, but we we know that um, that's just a sign of a healthy ecosystem. And so, are you talking about like the hippos and the lemonades, et cetera? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I, most of what's hot today has arguably been what's hot for the last couple of years. Um, maybe we haven't seen things evolve as rapidly as uh, as people would like, but um, we're starting to get traction 
And you can see that when you're on the inside at carriers and, and, and start to recognize these things get deployed, um, start to recognize these things um, get expanded into further geographies and start adding real value. That's when you know that something's here to say. And so um, looking at it from a core venture capitalist uh, perspective and, and having so many of my peers across the industry uh, looking at at similar things or tangential things, um, you know that the wave is 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 still in full force, and and we've got a lot of really exciting years ahead of us. Well, we are thrilled that you gave us um, some time and energy to to tell us about what's going on in your world, and I agree that I think that you guys are on the ground floor of a really exciting time going forward. And, uh, and, uh, I'm sorry that we've run out of time. I wish, I, I hope though, that you'll come back and do Ted Stuckey too with us. Can, can we, can we another Ted, another Ted talk? I'd be happy to guys. Would you, would really you do that? It. That'd be great. Okay. Of course. Of um, course. Thanks so much. And, um, and, uh, hopefully we'll cross your paths at one of these conferences real soon. Thanks a lot guys. Appreciate the time. You got it. Thank you. You know, Lee, I've been waiting to have um, somebody who's a straight up VC or CVC on our show. And um, what a great first um, uh, candidate or that we had with Ted, right? What a great guy. I mean, just a lot of information and a person who's from the industry, a person who right. really understands what an insurance company is. And right. now he gets to go out there, investigate, research implement uh just sounds like a perfect fit for a really nice guy i had a, a phone call a couple of weeks ago with uh with a with a vc who invests in insure tech among other other verticals and things mm -hmm. and you know i was ex not only we were were we talking about the specific companies that he was looking at we were also talking about um what they, you know, what their products are most especially. And I had to explain to him, you know, this is, this is what happens in insurance. This is what the landscape is, so on and so forth. Right. And, and, and that wasn't the case with Ted at all. I mean, I, he's an insurance guy. He's a CPCU. Yes, he, he has it all right. And, you know, I, I liked what he talked about. I liked his, um, his thoughts whenever he's interviewing and bringing in a new company to make sure that he's uh, really working around the pillars of underwriting, pricing, and claims. Mm -hmm. You know, he knows mm -hmm. what he wants. Mm -hmm. He knows what the company core beliefs mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. and he's going to go out and find those companies that really service that part uh, of, of the need. Right. And you, you know, you've got to have that at the core. You got to know what it is you're looking for before you you can go out and find it. Right. And he had some great advice. The advice about problem solving, and and you know mm -hmm. what I mean. That's that's a universal thing. Anybody who's selling something, you should solve a problem. But uh, yeah. th but that's great advice in this particular world that we that we that we're working in is uh, you know what is the problem that you're solving and the, and with the case the case study you gave on High Marley that not only were they clear about what the problem was they also had a way to roll the whole thing out they made it easy I didn't say this in the interview I mean it meant to but in sales you want to make it as easy as possible for the prospective customer to say yes. Right. You know, I'm Marley in that in that case study really did it all right. They said, this is what we're going to measure. This is how we're going to do it. And if it all goes well, are you prepared to go ahead and fully Im implement? Uh, it, it really sounds like a great formula to do in a pilot or really onboarding with any client. I also liked everything he had to say about conferences. Uh, yes, I was just thinking that myself. Uh -huh. And what were you thinking? Well, I was thinking about how there are so many conferences and it was kind of interesting that I'm on the same page as him as the ones that he likes. Mm -hmm. I had mm -hmm. often thought about the fintech and thought how interesting that would be because most of these interviews we hear, oh, you know, fintech, it's out there, it's one, it's five, it's 10 mm -hmm. years ahead of us. And I thought, well, is that where we go? Uh, do we go to the fintech events and the fintech conferences and actually learn what's coming our way? And uh, that sounds like a really interesting one. Well, hopefully 
we're going to get to see him at one of these conferences, you know, for sure. Insure tech will be at, uh, and I would absolutely love to, to see him and have a nice cup of coffee. Right. And we were real grateful to Ted Stuckey for giving us time and energy today. And we do look forward to meeting him at some point in the future and, um, invite you, uh, listeners to reach out to him as well. That's it for another exciting episode. We ask that if you want to support us, the best way to do that is to subscribe to our podcast, which you can do on iTunes, Spotify, or other podcasting platforms. And until next time, what do you say, Lee? Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.